end All my life is in your hands This whole world may hold me down But it can never drown you Good morning, everyone, and thanks for logging in and joining us for our service today. Uh, wherever you are, we pray that the Lord will be with you and that you'll know his presence uh, with you throughout this day. Let's begin our service by committing ourselves to God in prayer. Almighty and loving God, we gather together today, separated and yet united by your Holy Spirit. We come remembering your ancient promise to send your Spirit upon all people, young and old, male and female, Jew and Gentile. May we sense your spirit with us in a new way today. We come remembering the first Pentecost when your spirit was given to the apostles and all the disciples gathered together in prayer and how the spirit renewed their faith and powerfully transformed their lives. May we sense your spirit with us in a new way today. We come on this Pentecost Sunday reminded of your constant work of your spirit, inspiring, guiding, challenging, and refining. May his work continue in our lives today. 
Almighty God, Spirit of Truth, come as you promised and reveal to us more of the way of Christ. Come and fill us with deeper faith and greater love. Give us the gifts that we need to work for your kingdom. Inspire us with new vision and purpose and breathe your power into our lives again today. Almighty and loving God, open our hearts and minds and souls to your spirit and so equip us to live as your people, not just today but every day. And so may our whole lives reflect your glory and proclaim your love as the fruit of your spirit grows within us and the power of your spirit works through us. May we sense your spirit with us in a new way today to the glory of your name and for the common good. Amen. Well, our call to worship today has been chosen and will be read by Alan. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountains' peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Our Bible reading today is from uh, the Acts of the Apostles, and uh, I want to read uh, Acts chapter 2 and the first 21 verses. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's word for us today. 
in our services we normally have a time of intercessory prayer when we pray uh, for other people and uh, so uh, we're going to have that now and it's Francis who's going to lead us in prayer thank you Francis good morning everyone it's lovely to be with you this morning um, Jesus said are not two sparrows sold for a penny yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care so don't be afraid you are worth more than many sparrows. Let's pray. Loving, merciful, faithful God, eternal, majestic King of all creation, God our Father, thank you that you are our rock when everything around us is shaking. Thank you that our names are carved upon the palms of your hands. Thank you that we are more precious than sparrows. Thank you that because of you are our loving Father, we can feel safe and secure in your love. Father, today we pray for those who are sad and fearful. We remember with love those who have lost friends and family during this time. We especially remember Craig, Danielle and family, and Julie who have lost dear ones this week. Draw close to them and comfort them in their sorrow, Lord. We remember all who mourn, those who have been unable to say personal goodbyes and those who are having to endure grief alone due to social distancing. We pray your blessing on the staff at Strathcarran Hospice and thank you for their compassionate care for the dying. We pray for funeral directors and ministers as they strive to create meaningful services to deal with so many grieving people. Draw near to them and comfort them with your love. Father, we pray for all those who have been struggling with the isolation of lockdown, those who are elderly, those who are shielding, those who are caring for loved ones with life-limiting illnesses at home, and those whose existing mental health issues have got worse due to isolation, those for whom home is not a safe place. Draw close to them and strengthen them in their time of need. Father, we pray for those who have lost their jobs and are fearful that they may not be able to put food on the table or pay their bills. We thank you for all those agencies that are working hard to alleviate poverty through our churches, local council and third sector charities. We pray that as we slowly emerge from lockdown, we will all keep the guidelines and keep the R number going down so that businesses can safely resume work and more jobs won't be lost. Give wisdom to our governments and strength and integrity to our leaders. Father, we give you thanks for all the key workers who have put their fears aside and gone to work each day, knowing that what they're doing puts them at greater risk of infection. We thank you for our NHS staff, for carers, police, firefighters and prison officers, for teachers who have worked so hard to teach our children and support parents through homeschooling. We thank you for truck drivers, shelf stackers and shop assistants who have made sure that our food supply is there for us. Lord, we know that many on the front line will struggle with the aftermath of their experiences during this pandemic and we pray that they will be able to find the support they need. Lord, it says in your word that perfect love casts out fear. We thank you that although we have done nothing to deserve your love, you love us perfectly. We pray for an outpouring of your love on those who are sad and those who live in fear of what the future may bring. May they know what it is to be loved perfectly and held in your nail-scarred hands. In the precious name of Jesus, who loved us and gave his life for us. Amen. The Baptist Missionary Society is one of our mission partners and uh, they have called Baptist churches all around the world to celebrate today as Solidarity Sunday. And so we're going to watch a short message about that now from the BMS. A global pandemic is gripping the world and the news we see isn't telling the whole story. Thankfully, right now, in some of the most marginalised and fragile places that BMS World Mission works, COVID-19 appears to be contained, and we pray that that will last. But even now, nationwide lockdowns are having a devastating effect. The um, impact of the, of, the, of the lockdown has been pretty, pretty severe, particularly for uh, the economy. 
Um, most people here live uh, hand to mouth, day by day. Um, the money that they earn from their business activities is what they spend on feeding their family. Um, so um, shutting down the economy basically overnight has um, put you know many people at risk of um, of hunger and starvation. If coronavirus spreads uh, further um, and yeah, uh, there are far more cases than there are, there are right now, that has got the potential to be absolutely catastrophic to this country. Um, I'm not sure if there are any ventilators in the country. If there are, there are very few. Um, and so the ability for the hospitals here to care for the sickest patients is going to be um, severely limited. Um, yeah, so that is... That is a concern as the numbers start slowly increasing. We are praying for a miracle of protection for this land and these beautiful people, as the country is not in any way able to cope with a pandemic. If or when the virus takes hold here and spreads, the hospitals will be overrun and there are few facilities to isolate and support the chronically sick. What has been lovely has been how the community here has come together to support each other. Um, and you are part of that, as always, supporting us from afar with your, with your prayers and um, the financial support that you give to BMS. As always, in these, any crisis situation, we're just so proud of what BMS is doing. It's taking a really key role um, in the Christian global response, um, not just BMS, but as part of a wider push. So one of the things that they are doing is helping to find the PPE that people need, providing food, providing mental health support, um, really seeing on the bigger scale where things are needed and not just reactionary but in anticipation of knowing that the virus affects different countries um, in different ways um, and so if you would love to uh, be part of that response then BMS has a special fund. A global pandemic requires a global response. You can make a difference. Please pray, please give and please visit bmsworldmission.org slash coronavirus to help now. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, when Christians all around the world celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it, it can't be overstated how crucially important the Holy Spirit is in the lives of individual believers, uh, in the life of the church, indeed the life of the world. So churches of every denomination within the three great church traditions, Orthodox, Catholic and Protestant, uh, all celebrate and give thanks to God for the Holy Spirit coming amongst us. And the question is why? Why do we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit? Why does it matter that he came at all? So in seeking to answer those questions, I don't intend today to try and define who the Holy Spirit is or, or present a theological exposition of the Holy Spirit's identity. To be Christian is to accept that God is a trinity, Father, Son and Spirit. And so we'll start from the premise that the Holy Spirit is God. There's a, a famous uh, Monty Python sketch, uh, what have the Romans ever done for us? And today I want to kind of apply that question uh, to the Holy Spirit and briefly just sketch out a few things that the Holy Spirit has done, is doing and will do for us and therefore why we celebrate his coming to us. A good reason for taking this approach is simply that as Keith Warrington has written, the Holy Spirit is difficult to define. As soon as we attempt to explain him, our language becomes less helpful than we might have hoped. And it's important to remember that not only is our intellect too small to encompass him, but our language is too limited to explain him. At best, it provides metaphors that helps us to tiptoe our way into an exploration of his character. 
So we're going to wander through a few verses from the New Testament that relate in some way to uh, the activity uh, of the Holy Spirit on our behalf. And from the start, I want to acknowledge that my list of activities of the Spirit is in no way intended to be a complete or exhaustive list. Rather, it's more just a few snapshots that, as Warrington says, helps us to tiptoe into an exploration of his character. In the Gospel of John, chapter 16, Jesus speaks about the coming of the Holy Spirit and he tells his disciples that it's necessary that the Spirit to come. Uh, For when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness and judgment. The phrase that John uses can be translated in a number of ways, but the sense is always that the Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world regarding sin because without that conviction, they will not believe. On the one level, the Spirit convicts the world that its ideas about sin are wrong. We've got everything backwards. The world calls evil good and good evil. Um, And so the Spirit comes and and corrects that thinking uh, in, in our societies. On an individual level, the Holy Spirit convicts people about the truth of who Jesus is. That he is no false prophet or snake oil salesman, but rather he is who John declares him to be. He is God in the flesh. In doing so, the Spirit convicts us about the reality of our own sin. And according to Bruce Milne, the verb that John uses literally means to show someone his sin and summon him to repentance. Just as John the baptizer came to be a witness to the light, so too the Holy Spirit will testify about the light by empowering the proclamation message of the life, death, resurrection and enthronement of Jesus as the saving king so that the human conscience is quickened and awakened to the truth of it and we are called to repent. In fact, that's exactly what you see happening in Acts chapter 2. For immediately after the Spirit comes upon the disciples, we find Peter proclaiming the gospel about Jesus. If you read further on in the chapter, you'll find that as a result of Peter's Spirit-empowered proclamation, about 3,000 people were convicted of their sin, repented and became disciples of Jesus that day. Being convicted of our sinfulness would not be helpful if that were all that the Holy Spirit did. But as noted in doing so, he also calls us to repentance and brings about saving faith in Jesus. In Romans chapter 8 verses 9 to 16, the Apostle Paul affirms that the Spirit gives us eternal life. And that through him we receive the spirit of adoption so that we are able to call God Abba, meaning father or daddy. He writes in verse 16 that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So, because of the Holy Spirit, we become aware of our our sinfulness, of our need for a saviour, and through the work of the Spirit, we are called to repentance, and upon repentance, we are given eternal life, becoming adopted children of God the Father. In fact, Paul goes on to say, that if we are God's children, then we are co-heirs with Christ, the Son. And that leads us to another thing that the Holy Spirit does for us. He gives us an inheritance. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, Paul writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now in normal human affairs the children have an inheritance from their parents and so it is with God and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within each disciple of Jesus is the guarantee that we will inherit what is promised by God. That inheritance is beyond our capacity to fully imagine and the New Testament never really provides a detailed or complete account of it, but it does allude to certain aspects of it. 
For example, the Apostle Peter describes it as being an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for us. So if we open the window to heaven in the book of Revelation, we were given a glimpse of heaven in chapter 22, verses 3 to 5, we are told no longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. What an inheritance. In 1 John 3 and 2 we're told that we are already God's children But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Part of our inheritance is to be like Christ. Another part of our inheritance will be the physical transformation of our bodies. In Philippians 3 and 20, verse 21, uh, Paul writes that we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our saviour. He will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Tell me, do you feel like celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit yet? Because there's more. The Holy Spirit not only guarantees our inheritance in the future, but he actively transforms our lives day by day in the present. Firstly, he changes our desires and our attitudes, and by changing them, he changes our actions by actively growing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The theological term is that he sanctifies us. He makes us in practice what we already are in the eyes of God, holy and righteous children of God. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul contrasts the life that's controlled by the sinful nature with the life that's controlled by the Holy Spirit. And he makes it clear that the two ways of living are incompatible with one another. In verses 16 and 17, he writes, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. He warns in verse 21 that anyone whose life is controlled by their sinful nature will not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast to that kind of life, he says that the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so, by the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we are transformed to become more like Christ in our attitudes and in our actions. And the key to this fruitfulness is in the command of Galatians 5 and 25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Our lives are changed by the fruit of the Spirit growing within us. But we shouldn't ignore or forget the fact that we have a part to play in that process. We are commanded in Scripture that we should keep in step with the Spirit. We should pray in the Spirit at all times. We should allow the Spirit to guide our lives. And we should keep on being filled with the Spirit. And crucially, we should not grieve the Spirit. If we obey these commands, we will find that the fruit of the Spirit is present in our lives in an ever-increasing abundance of fruitfulness. Then in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 11, Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit also gives the disciple not just fruits of character, but spiritual gifts to help them serve one another. And we all have different gifts. So every member of the church has a vital part to play in the church's life and in its mission in the world. But there's more than that. For not only do we get fruitfulness in our lives, not only do we get uh, spiritual gifts to be able to serve, but we get power. 
The power that we need to live as disciples serving Jesus, our saving King, and advancing his kingdom in the present age. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus tells us when the Spirit comes upon us, we will receive power. Power to be his witnesses in the world. To bear witness in word and deed and by the transformation of our lives. So tell me, do you feel like celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit yet? Because there's more. In John 14 verse 26, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as a, as a helper, as a comforter, as a counsellor who draws alongside us to help us. He said this to his disciples as their hearts were broken. They were filled with sorrow because he'd been talking about leaving them and they were heart sick about it. And he said that the Spirit will come and help them and comfort them. Paul echoes this in Romans 8 and 26 where he writes, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So not only does he draw alongside us to help us and comfort us when we're in sorrow, but he also prays on our behalf. He prays for us when we don't know what to pray for. But there's more. He helps us to remember what we've forgotten. In John 14 and 26, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will remind us of everything that he has taught us. And so in Ephesians 3, Paul describes the Holy Spirit as the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He brings to mind the teaching of Jesus and he helps us to understand it. And in John 16, Jesus says that the Spirit will guide us into all truth. And that includes the truth of what will happen in the future. He will glorify Jesus by revealing to us what he receives from him. And there's more. There is so much more. But even in this very brief wander through a few texts, we can see that there is so much for us to celebrate and give thanks for in the coming of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, Paul says that those who do not have the Spirit are not Christians at all. And so above all, we celebrate and thank God for the role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. We give thanks that God is always greater than we can imagine. And giving us his own spirit, he has given us more than we could ever have imagined or hoped for. I hope you will celebrate with me today the coming of the Holy Spirit and all that he does and is doing in and through our lives. Thanks for listening today. If you uh, want to know more about becoming a disciple of Jesus or if you want to find out more about Denny Baptist Church and how you can support our work in our community, uh, then please contact us by direct message on Twitter at Denny Baptist or find us on Facebook or through our contacts page at dennybaptist.org.uk. Let's close our time together by in praying together. Almighty God, loving Father, full of compassion, Merciful Saviour, full of grace, life-giving spirit, spirit, full of power, sovereign God, full of majesty, fill our hearts and minds and souls and send us out to build your kingdom for the praise of your glory and the common good, that the Lamb might receive the reward of his suffering. Amen. Thanks for being with us today and God bless you all.